the Preseli Mountains, Pembrokeshire, a land of prehistoric settlements. Source of the Blue Stones of Stonehenge, and more recently, popular for those seeking self-sufficiency, the good life. Tucked away in the foothills of the Preselis, one eco-community lives here completely off-grid growing their food, rearing their animals, <laughs> composting their waste, generating their own electricity, and with their own water supply. <laughs> Successive residents at Brithdir Maur have enjoyed this independence for 25 years, often opening their doors to visitors and volunteers eager to learn about their sustainable way of life, as well as leading the way in new eco-housing laws after a lengthy, notorious planning dispute. But now, change is coming. They have to embrace the world of business if they want to stay. The lease is up at the end of the year and we don't want it to go to a private buyer. We want it to go into a trust so it can benefit future generations to come. The owner is selling up. The old farmhouse, the converted cow sheds, detached eco houses and the 85 acres of land will all go on the open market if the community can't raise a million pounds to buy their homes. You know, I have no doubt that it would sell and it would become a, a second home, <laughs> a holiday home. It's a make or break year for saving their eco-village. December the 21st, and the North Pembrokeshire coastal town of Newport is busy with Christmas shoppers. Just a mile up the road, however, in the eco-village of Brithdir Maur, they're doing something different, already preparing for their big feast that evening, the winter solstice. More than 80% of the food consumed by the community is grown by them, and even in winter, fresh veg can be harvested. Lee Trainer used to work all hours in the London area as a project manager for the restaurant industry. Doing, well, I'd say nine to five, but it was more like four in the morning until eight, 10 o'clock at night, and then you know, we'd, we'd do stuff together at the weekends as a family and cursed homeschools the kids. So, you know, she was busy all during the week. So it, it, essentially it was, we were living two separate lives sort of side by side. But now living at Brift here, we do everything together now. Lee, Kirsty, and their two children, like most of the 17 residents, live in rented converted cow sheds and barns around the shared farmhouse. We are preparing for our winter solstice meal. People in their own living spaces preparing different parts of the menu, like if you like, and then we'll come together this evening with uh, all the dishes that we've prepared for one big feast. Across the yard, Eve, Ben and their three children, who moved from their ex-council house in Suffolk, are also busy doing their bit for the communal feast. I'm in charge of the Christmas puddings and the brandy butter. And Ben's been doing the uh, roast potatoes and gravy. And it's like celebrating the sun coming Mama. back and the warmth coming back and thinking about Mama. what we're going to do uh, next year. You know, we've got a lot of energy to kind of move things forward and, you know, change the way things have happened here and to kind of, you know, look more <sighs> outwards and you know, not just be about kind of producing food and being self-sufficient, but like actually kind of having an impact in the wider community. Many of the community are newly arrived young families searching for a better quality of life, time, space and freedom, especially for their children. When we joined the community, I feel I was probably a little bit blinked in the demands of what it would be because I think I really wanted it more than, you know, I, I don't think I looked at the, 
to things like that as much. And I Your plan just... was very rose-tinted, wasn't it? Yeah, you yeah. Know. You didn't think of any potential hiccups. But I only think of hiccups. That's my role <laughs> in, like, our marriage. You know? <laughs> I'm the real pessimist. So I told him, oh, you know, we're going to have to deal with this. And, well, what if that happens? And he was like, oh, you know, it'd be great, it'd be great. <laughs> um, but so it's, it's kind of a bit of both. A bit of lemon juice, a bit of salt. Actually. Heather and George are the latest arrivals, only in their second month, still settling in. We met in Edinburgh and we're kind of living very much like a city existence there. We really wanted to kind of make a, a big change in our lives, and I think we'd always spoken about uh, wanting to live in a community and the idea of kind of living in an isolated bubble and in flats um, just really didn't appeal to us. We then set about trying to work out where we might want to live and then we came for a volunteer week. As we were cycling away, we were just pulled back, just like this feeling of this kind of felt like it could be home. While Nick is one of the more established residents who welcomes the new families, bringing fresh energy and ideas. The newbies, fantastic. So we're really lucky to have this new influx. Um, we've decided as a community now we're going to hold, you know, so we're not going to look for new members for a while until we've managed to get over this, this steep hurdle of, of, of trying to raise the money to buy the place. Came to visit friends over here, totally fell in love with West Wales and Pembrokeshire and, you know, the rugged, wild scenery that you have here, an amazing coastline. Yeah, been here ever since. The community's 25-year lease expires in just a few days' time, but the landowner has given them a few more months to find the money to buy him out. The sun starts to rise. We can start to gain energy going into 2020 and setting us on the path to try and save the land here. Let's have a good next year. Cheers. <laughs> Every Wednesday, the whole community gets together for group discussions and decisions. The decision-making is really yeah. difficult. You've got to put it on the agenda. You've got to hear what people want to say about it. You've got to then wait a week in case people want to mull it over and talk yeah. about it again. And you do get a lot back in return, but if you're someone that likes to just get up and get on, it's hard. Although most have part-time jobs off-site, everyone is expected to contribute about 20 hours a week and take a lead role in one part of the community. For Kirsty, it's poultry. You know, it's really good for their enrichment that they get out and walk around, but for this amount of chickens, we can't have them doing that the whole time, you know? We just found a gap, so they could be getting through there, but some are flying up and over, and um, it doesn't take long when the ground's so wet for them to just annihilate it. Yeah, I've kept hens for years. We've had them as pets, so they've all had names and, you know. And I'm refraining from doing that here because some of them do end up in a pot, so I don't want to get double attached to them. But actually, it's amazing how quickly you can reevaluate and you can think, actually, yeah, this works, you know. I, I couldn't imagine looking after an animal that we were going to eat before we came here, you know, I... Yeah, that was just... Yeah, really, really foreign to me completely. But actually now, it feels natural, which is really strange, because I didn't think that would be the case before. Because I still don't eat the chickens, but, you know, I'm still vegetarian, but the kids do, and Lee does, and hearing from people here that actually it's really important that they know where their meat's from and the life it's had. I reckon it's maybe once every couple of weeks. There's a few chickens that are killed. The kids have taken part in it. So that was quite important for me. If they're going to eat it, it's really nice that they kind of see what, what goes into it. Mummy, we're all going to name a sheep, and that one's called This is Fluffy. That one's called Lucky. Okay. Well, remember Fluffy. that they, some of them will be eaten, darling, so don't get too oh, attuned. I hope that's not well, You could call one. them lamb chop. <laughs> yeah, like, like, and cutlet and stuff. Let's <laughs> maybe do that, and then we're ready. In a lot of environments, in a lot of locations, eating vegan would be the most sustainable way. Not in West Wales. You know, we can't grow a protein source here. We don't have the sort of land for that. We can't do it. So for us here, 
eating sustainably is to rear animals on the grass that we have, you know, otherwise the grass is just a dead resource. There is also Keith, the pilgrim goose. He lost two female companions to a fox and has had to be penned in to prevent him pecking everyone while new companions are found. <laughs> and there are several goats for milk and cheese. Apart from liking goats, I mean, I, yeah, I've never milked before. It's amazing being able to milk them and then just go and drink it straight away. And it's just, that's how I'd like to be living, just that close to your food. And that's the kind of way of life I would like to continue living, really. It's just adjusting to a rural way of life and community life, really. The dynamics of being around lots of people all the time, which is quite an interesting one. Yeah, it just takes up a lot of your energy, because normally if you kind of even <laughs> live in a flat or something like that, um, you're only just around a few people and you can kind of conserve your energy, but here you can have small interactions all the time. So it's just quite interesting. So you're always just like helping someone out or um, looking after the kids for a bit or going to milk or surprise things that always pop up and we're just like, whoa, it's actually surprising. Um, yeah, they can be quite like, quite tiring in a way, I guess always being around people. But the amount that we've learned is just, like every day, just kind of learning something new. Most came here to escape to the land, but now they have to turn entrepreneurs to survive. So have asked an advisor to help them write and sell a business plan for the future. Rather than trying to sell what happens here at Brittany Mauer, is what they can give back to the wider society, the knowledge that they've got. And I think that is their key selling point, is that they live in this particular way. And this is something that, especially with uh, uh, climate change agenda at the moment, um, this is a way that we may need to change to in order to go yeah, forward. Take that out. Yeah. What do you think about adventurous? Wrestling with the requirements of the outside world is nothing new. In the late 90s, the eco-community originally included a grass-roofed roundhouse. But when national park planners took to the air, they spotted its solar panels. They said that this is in total breach of planning rules because you can't build in the open countryside. And I said, well, why not? Because this area once was full of small holders with maybe an acre or two. This went on for, for about eight years. The community rallied around Tony, protesting to the planners and sparking news headlines. We had a kind of ceasefire, in a way. While they got their policy together, the Welsh Assembly was producing this new policy of one planet development, which is that you can build in the open countryside, provided that you um, live a one planet lifestyle. You've got to be carbon neutral, you've got to live sustainably. Not everybody wants to live like this or could live like this. The Welsh Government's unique One Planet planning law approving genuinely sustainable development led to the growth of other eco-villages and is now seen as pioneering. I've always liked roundhouses and the idea of living in a roundhouse and so I looked at a lot of roundhouses through history really, how they've been designed. We've got 150 straw bales in the roof, tied together in a spiral, and then turf on top of that. Grapes grow on the roof. I get about 15 kilos of grapes off the roof every year. And warm water from the sun and electricity from the sun. It's worked quite well. I do not want to live in this world and just take. I want to explore the potential of living with the earth instead of against it. Tony's roundhouse is now secure. His plot next door to the community is owned by a trust and attracts visitors from around the world. One of the farm buildings is used as a classroom for both the wider community and residents. We've started learning Welsh yeah. for a start, yeah, so that's... we can 
integrate, so that's good. So we do that with the kids yeah. um, and a few other people here once a week. Oh, I think it's fantastic. It's absolutely great. But it fits into the philosophy here because there's a bunch of really nice people here trying to do something very extremely important. They're trying to live in harmony with nature, with the environment. And they understand that the language in the part of the world where they have come to live is a part of that. And so I think they're absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting late. No, no, that's fine. Slowly progressing in the Welsh. <laughs> it's taking a bit of time. <laughs> but getting the getting mm. the very basics. But it's just yeah, really interesting to mm. learn. Shamai. And then B replies. Shumai. Shurihi. Shurihi. And to us, it's not meaningful to talk about the environment unless the language is included in that. The environment has been named going back thousands of years. And of course, the most famous prose tales from Wales are probably the Mabinogion tales. A large part of the Mabinogion happens through this part of Wales. The Mabinogion, the medieval collection of Welsh myths and legends, tells of an Arthurian battle here with a giant boar killing the king's sons. There is something mystic and primeval in this rugged landscape, with the exact source of the blue stone inner circle of Stonehenge nearby. The farm's name itself, Brythir Maur, meaning big mottled land, may well be derived from the blue stones strewn around the fields. In one, they've been re-erected into what's believed to be the original Bronze Age circle, providing a spiritual centre for some residents and visitors. It's pretty amazing that, you know, thousands of years ago, people moved stones from here down to Wiltshire. I mean, that just is incredible, really. It's completely different to a lot of the farms around. So it has that kind of ancient feel to it, especially this part of the farm, you know, and you look around and, you know, you look up at the mountain and it kind of just looks timeless. This setting could be from a thousand years ago, really. And it definitely has that feel to it. It's very... It, you know, it's, it's more than just a place, you know, it's kind of, it's very rooted in, yeah, in the past. Each month, the community hosts a volunteers week, where a group come to work on the land unpaid in exchange for training in self-sufficiency skills. It's part of our remit that, you know, we've got this fabulous 85 acres in a beautiful location and we want to share that with as many people as possible and also share, you know, the benefits and the problems with community living. So hopefully they go away with a little idea of how they could live sustainably, how community life works. This is my first time somewhere like Brith Day Mower where there's people living uh, in a community. So that's really special. I think people seem to really like their way of life. Well, I think the second thing is they seem to really practice what they preach and are living in a very different way. Yeah, it's kind of becoming more commonplace, compost loose, and once you go in there, there's a lot of people that are always really pleasantly surprised because they think that it's going to be this harrowing experience and then they get there and they actually really enjoy it, you know, because they realise that it's all in harmony with nature and it doesn't stink. Often there's a way better view than there would be if you were going into a toilet in someone's house. So. Got, got a poo with a view here. <laughs> exactly. <using> the <laughs> Meanwhile, Lee is busy improving electricity generating capacity with a new solar roof. So the difference this will make to us is going to be more energy production. Three times more than what we're already producing. So it means that we'll be able to run, say, power tools and more appliances at any one time. It'd be nice to be able to use more power tools. I like using hand tools and stuff, but yeah, being able to use uh, a saw now and then, electric saw now and then would be really handy. We would like businesses to be started on the land so, you know, we're putting in the infrastructure beforehand so that we can move forward with other plans of be it, be it educational facility, a retreat for when they come and hold, hold their courses and stuff. 
but before the month is out, it's locked down. Fundraising plans are postponed and the community decides to treat itself as one big family. No visitors or volunteers are allowed. In the outside world, there's panic buying. Long queues and empty shelves in supermarkets, desolate streets and fear. For us, life hasn't really changed that much. What I think we have is our natural life. What's positive about this at the moment, I think personally, is that it gives people a chance to reflect on what is actually important in life and to just to slow down a bit, just slow it down. Morning all on this fine sunny day. Today's task is uh, loading the wood bays. Kids are out here bow sawing, curse, chopping and stacking, and I get the hard job of filming. <laughs> All the children are now being schooled at home. What are we doing today, kids? Dragon. We have three children, and they just have absolutely thrived here. They, as you can imagine, they have access to all this land and places to play and people to support them. Yeah, they absolutely love it. Either uh, her sitting on the eggs or he's sitting outside protecting the nest. That's their mate in there, that. That's two, that's three. Right, should we cover it back up? This is a great day. <laughs> There's Bridget. All right, Bridget. This one's Cecilia. Yeah, so she's got one kid. Our goat, Dazzle, um, gave birth to two twins. How exciting was that? Really exciting. It can. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. Oh god. Oh, the first steps. Bridget. Oh my. Despite their idyllic surroundings, the residents are not immune to the pandemic. Three are key workers, carers in local homes and colleges for vulnerable and special needs people, and doing extra long shifts in the crisis. I kind of started the week of the corona thing, which was a bit bizarre. I was wondering kind of what job I would do when living here, so it's been really nice um, to find that role and to kind of feel more settled here. I guess starting work makes me feel like I'm really starting to live here and kind of build up a life and things. So when you go off site to work and you, you know, speaking with my colleagues and experiencing all their experiences of coronavirus and lockdown, it's very different. Everybody is thinking now they've been at home a while, you know, with a little bit of space, they're, they're making their front gardens into little raised beds, aren't they? And, and seeing what they can grow at home and do for themselves. And I think it would be really interesting and a lovely thing to be involved in, in supporting communities and, and people to continue that exploration. With summer, fresh fruit and veg is starting to appear. So we've got some of the first strawberries of the year, which is kind of exciting. So far throughout the year, we haven't had really any fruit. Mm. Mm, it's actually really good. I think in the past, I tried to grow things, and it kind of turned out like a big pile of weeds and that I'd been watering for kind of months on end. Last week, I kind of ate my first broad beans, which was the first thing I've ever kind of grown for myself. So, yeah, it's been really exciting. Lockdown has also allowed the community time to develop their business plan with some new ideas on raising cash. In this field, the lake field, this section at the, the bottom end, we're going to convert into community-supported agriculture. The reason why we've done that is because one, the pandemic itself has, you know, a bit of a stumbling block in with regards to our original plans and getting it off the ground. But also, in the area, 
there has been this real drive for um, food security. So they want to look at localising the food supply chains. And one way of doing that is a veg box scheme where we can, we can use this amount of land here to grow seasonal veg. So our plan is to plant at least three acres of orchards. So we'll be producing a significant amount of apple juice and cider and vinegar from that. And in between the apple trees plant rows of strawberries and raspberries. You know, they're, they're high value crops and it's a popular pastime going and picking fruit. Uh, and there's not really anything else in the area. So behind that line over there, which will be a hedgerow, we're planning to put a car park. The road is just behind that hedge there, which comes up from Newport. So this will be like the first section of orchards um, that we'll be planting. But they need more time to put their plans into action and attract investors. Now living in Wiltshire, Brithir's owner has examined the business plan and made a new agreement. This business plan is the first time that really something's come forward that, that matches the possibilities of the place, that they've thought about it, they've got together something that's been discussed and is legally founded, and it puts them in the centre of everything that they want to do. And I'm really, really impressed, really glad that they're going ahead. So we've extended the time. I've said, yeah, you've got five, well, in fact, six years, really, to raise the money. I don't want to die owning Brithdeer. I want the community to own it and the community to kind of go independent and really, really run with it. And that's the hope. Summer solstice today. Yeah, we're basically having a big barbecue. Um, so these are a few of our old uh, layers who aren't very good layers anymore. I thought um, chicken burgers. We've got um, Ben's chicken burgers, some feta and halloumi cheese made from our goat's milk. And then we've got some hummus from our beans from Bottom Garden. Our coleslaw is cabbage from Bottom Garden, beetroot from the polytunnels. So it's basically a whole plate of rifted food here. We've got a pretty good business plan together now, and you know, over the next five years, I feel pretty confident that you know, we're going to be able to kind of set these businesses up, and you know, I feel people will want to invest in that. Now it's secure, all the kind of things that we came here, the ideas we came here with, this five-year lease now lets us actually imagine that we can do that, you know, rather than a dream. So, yeah, yeah, I think we'll, we'll crack on. <laughs> I say it has been saved, yes. It's not going to be going on the market, and that was the biggest worry for everyone. Yes, 100% it's saved. The message will be going out to the wider community that, yeah, watch this space and uh, let's see what we can uh, deliver. It's going to be great. Bye.